Hello, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to have all of you after lunch and after, I think, a keynote at Red Hat Summit. So uh, my name is Edson Yanaga. I'm from Brazil. I'm a Brazilian. And I work as a director of developer experience at the, at the Red Hat Developers Group. And today I'm going to talk about a bit about how can you develop and deploy your applications, your, uh, especially your, your microservice architecture, using some resilience trips to get your high availability and other uh, benefits from the microservice architecture. I also have, happen to be a Java champion, and currently I'm also in a Microsoft MVP. I know it might sound kind of weird, but uh, I have these this two different titles. Yeah, I work for, with Java since ever, I, uh, uh, 20 years, and uh, in the past years I've been working a lot of how can we deploy Java applications on, on Azure. That's why I got the Microsoft MVP title, and that's my Twitter handle, at Yanaga. And I always like to uh, start my talks talking about this uh, a sentence from Forbes. Now every company is a software company. We live in a very special and different moment of our lives where everything is software enabled. We have some pretty curious uh, examples in our modern economy. Because the largest car transportation company in the world owns no cars. The largest lodging company in the world owns no real estate. The largest online retainer in the world owns no stock, which is Alibaba. And the largest content network in the world produces no content, which is Facebook. I don't know if that's good content or bad content, but that's content anyway. Uh, and all of these companies have something in common because they are all enabled by software. Yeah? They don't have another kind of, uh, of economic system behind it. They're all enabled by software. They are run by software. And software, uh, uh, for sure, is the most important asset they have running their business. And I know how many of you were in the Dev Nation keynote, Monday's Dev Nation's keynote on, uh, with Harry. But Harry is talking about a bit that dev moment that you have in your life. I know when you started the coding, the flow, yeah? and I forgot the other one. I hope he doesn't get that. But, <laughs> okay. But I, have, I remember uh, some of these moments, and uh, I guess they were important for me at some time. But uh, uh, today I like to think differently because my life has changed a lot in the past years, and I'd like to share with you what has changed in my life uh, since then, because uh, I like the sense, because the two most important days in your life are the days that we were born and the day you find out why. This, this sentence from Mark Twain it means a lot to me, because uh, I used to do things by myself, but then one day as a software developer, I realized that software can change other people's lives, and we can change their lives for the better, but we can also change their lives for the worse. So we know that wonderful feeling when we can get a user, a customer, when we can deliver something and change their lives for the better, but we also know how to make them miserable. We also know how to feel miserable when someone delivers shitty software to you. So we know that the different feelings. And I and decided that I wanted to change the people's lives for the better. But I also realized that as a software engineer, uh, even if I were a very good or great software engineer, my power to change other people's lives were, were kind of limited. And I started some years ago that I would share uh, the, the things that I could get, the knowledge and my time, and I would start to spend some time trying to help other people to deliver better software faster in some way. That's why I'm very happy with my role at Red Hat Developers which is basically to empower uh, all of developers around the world to deliver better software faster. So I get to have a hobby and also get paid for that. So it's very amazing for me to be here sharing these experiences because some, uh, that's, that's uh, another subject for another talk. But I think that most of the things that we do for happiness in our lives are uh, get involved with something with giving uh, something to other people and I hope that I'll be able to, to share some knowledge to, to empower people to deliver better software, at least in this case with microservices architecture. I'd also like to say that software is made by people for people, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that there are humans involved, some economics on that. I used it to think that when I was younger that economics meant uh, mathematics or meant numbers or meant money. But after studying just a bit the, the subject, I realized that economics has nothing to do with money, but it has everything to do about people. How people interact with each other to realize or to produce an output. So if software is, a, is developer for people, 
uh, by people, of course that's an economic system. And, if you, and, and when we try to separate the people from the software that we're producing, we usually have, we don't have that great results that we want. That's why I also like to, to put the word legacy in context, because if we, if we try to look in our lives, legacy usually in other contexts in our lives usually is, doesn't mean a bad thing. Because, you know, as a human, my, my life's purpose is to deliver something to my kids. I want to leave something better for my kids. Uh, I want to leave the world a better place when I die compared to when I was born. So I want to leave, uh, I want to leave a, a better place to, to my kids, to my grandkids, to the people I love, to the people don't, I don't know. In this case, legacy is a good thing. And I always think, why in software legacy is always a bad thing? Why do you have bad shivers? Uh, that the shivering when someone says that you have to handle legacy code, uh, legacy database. So, in, uh, why is that? And I like to do another definition. Uh, I, I like to give another definition of what is legacy, for, because for me, any code delivered to production, production is legacy, because legacy means someone, you, something you have to maintain, some, some, something that you need to keep delivering value, because if it's not delivering value, you, 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 you could just delete that, it wouldn't matter. So we need to deliver something to production that has to deliver value, and I think the legacy can be a good thing because I used to be very critical about other people's codes because I always said, even to my code, oh, that's shitty code, the code I wrote last, last week or last month. Now I, I've learned it from a professor. Uh, uh, when I, uh, uh, I gave a, a talk in a university and, uh, and one of the professors told me, asking me about uh, the definition of competence. And I was very happy to know, uh, now, now, I, now that I know the definition, because I always thought that competence mean, uh, have something to mean about proficiency. And then he told me that competence has nothing to do with proficiency, because competence comes from the Latin competere, which, which means competing against yourself, not others. So if you're competing against yourself, and by the end of the day you win, you're a competent person, because you're a better person at the end of the day compared to the morning. So I'm very amazed to say that uh, uh, I try to be a competent person, and I think that everybody in our profession should be striving to be competent in that. We need to improve it a lot if, instead of just seeking proficiency. And today when I look at some bad code that I have written uh, some time ago, uh, in fact, I'm quite happy, because if I think that my code is shitty today, that's because today I know that I can do much better, and I will, yeah. at least try. Okay, so another concept that, that is very important in software development is the feedback loop. You know, everything in our lives as humans, we need the feedback loop because uh, we, uh, as humans, we are kind of in input driven. So that's how we learned how to walk, that's how we learned how to talk. We needed some audio input and so our parents' input to know if we were talking the things correctly. If we're trying to, to we need the, the, the feedback, feedback mechanism to know if we're, if we're not, if we're just walking straight or something. That's how we learn how to write the back too. And in software, we need this feedback to know if you're doing the right thing. And we need this, this feedback to know if you're doing the thing right too. Because the longer the feedback it is, the worse the software that we, del we deliver. So think about some, uh, I, I am a Java programmer, but sometimes I have a bit of envy from dynamic uh, languages, which is the ability for you to just code, save the file, and reload, and see the result. Uh, in Java, we know we have some tools like JRebel uh, that uh, enables us to do that too. But since the feedback loop is so short, it's much easier for me to know if I'm doing the right thing. Oh, I need to change the color, change the output, change this, just change these methods, change the positioning. It's much easier for me to, to, to achieve something when the feedback loop is shorter. Uh, and, why, and why is that? Uh, uh, the feedback loop allows us to deliver better software when it's shorter, when it's better, because we as humans, we need something in our minds called context. Context is the thing that, and I call context the amount of things that you can have in your brain at the same time, because if the context too, is too big, you usually miss some pieces and you deliver bugs into production. So the shorter the context that you can have in your mind to think about, the faster you will deliver a solution. And if the faster you deliver a solution, the better the feedback loop, and you know if doing the things right or the right thing. So, a question that I would like to ask you is, uh, we always have software development pro uh, problems, and what is preventing you today from delivering faster? 
We all have some excuses that we like to say to ourselves, to our bosses, to our teams. So what is preventing you now? And historically, if you try to understand what happened in the past 20 or 30 years in software development, uh, we can check that each one of the improvements that we have in the past, we're all trying to improve what I call the feedback loop. Because usually the main number one uh, cause of issues is bugs. We don't deliver s software faster because we have too many bugs and we have to correct them before delivering to production. So uh, we try to, to input some uh, first manual testing, then unit testing. Now we have integration testing, st stress testing, and behavior testing, all of this testing to prevent bugs into going to production. So if we, instead of just manually running our test, we have an automated tool for, do, to, for doing that for us, you know, I just run a Maven build and I, and I know if I broke something that some other people uh, wrote, uh, I, can, uh, I can deliver software faster. I don't have to go into production just to know, oh, uh, I, I added a bug into production, let's roll back or anything else. If I know uh, just running by my build to know if the, test, the, the, the code is correct, my feedback loop is improved too. Then, I don't know how many of you are that old, but uh, one of the hardest problems that we have in the software development world before the addition of continuous integration was integration problems. And it's by far the hardest one to solve because it's hard to know you have one context in your mind, but it's very hard to coordinate your changes in your, the changes in your code base when you have many other people coding in the same code base. So it's very easy for you to check in something in your, in your code base that will just spoil what other people did. So integration problem is by far the hardest problem to solve. And we try to solve that by doing integ integration more often. Yeah? I had a very curious case of a very large bank, very large public bank in Brazil, which I will not tell the name, but uh, they used to have like more than 100 people working on the same code base. And the only day that they did integration was the deployment day. Okay, and the, and the code integration, it wasn't done by the developers because they were all home. It was done by the operators who were supposed to check out the code and try to compile that because nobody integrated that before. Of course, the, the code didn't compile. And they just kept it all the night long trying, doing what? They just opened VI, yeah? and they were just commenting out the codes that didn't compile. So by the end of the nine, night, they tried to, oh, now it's compiling, deploy that. For some strange reason, it did never work, okay? <laughs> but that, but that, that's, that's real, uh, because integration is very hard, and they did it like only once, la, la, once, la, uh, once once every three or four months. So continuous integration tried to solve the problem doing that daily or at uh, hourly or at each commit that you do. Then we had some problems preventing us from delivering software faster, which was manual deployments, lots of repetitive tasks that we had to do. Then we tried to solve that with continuous delivery or continuous deployment. We tried to automate our pipelines. Then now again, we, are, we have the people problem. We have integration problems again. We can't deliver software because our code base is always breaking. We're just introducing bugs and testing is not enough. Now we're talking about microservices because we want to solve the integration issues. And one of the main things that uh, I've, I've seen uh, in the microservice subject is people are trying to scale codes, but codes or deployments are the main reason for be using microservices because we're trying to scale people and not simply codes. Uh, I know it's much easier to scale just one piece of your software into production to guarantee uh, put more nodes on your, my cache, on my front end, on in my database, or something else. It's much easier to scale that, but that's not the main reason for me doing microservices, because uh, that uh, has to do with scalability. And with microservices, we want to solve the problem that we need to deliver software faster. Uh, we need to improve our feedback loop. Uh, because uh, I know we always complain that the business guys, they don't know what they ask us because when we go to production, nobody uses that. But imagine how hard is that when a business person asks us for a new feature and we take like six months to deliver that. Everything that he had in mind in his context to ask for that is not true anymore. So even for business, feedback loop is important. The shorter, the better. And you know, I like to say the microservices are basically distributed systems. We had this theory for a long, long time. And distributed systems are very hard. And most of the software engineers, they haven't handled that in the past 40 years. But 
people are harder. So uh, uh, distributed systems have a high toll, which I always say that is worth paying when you have enough people messing around with your code base. So when you, when you reach some level, uh, we have some threshold there. When, reach, we, when you reach some level, it's much worth paying the toll for distributed systems rather than just having code bases that break daily because people are just committing and spoiling what other people do. And we're trying to solve the integration issues by reducing the context to a cohesive microservice. So, you know, in uh, traditionally in history, I don't know how many of you have seen the, the ThoughtWorks keynote in the Monday's afternoon, too. But uh, it's all about people, con is well. And we're always, in history, we're always trying to solve the same problem because we are exceptionally bad in that. We always want to write code that is highly cohesive and has low coupling. We try to achieve that with functions, procedures. We try to achieve that with modules. Yeah. We try to achieve that with some artifacts, and now we're trying to achieve that with microservices, and we keep doing that wrong, okay? Because it has nothing to do with technology, it has nothing to do with architecture, but it has everything to do about how we partition our domain model. Uh, so that's why I value so much the concept of uh, domain-driven design. I don't know how many of you practice that every day, but I think it's the most important concept that we can apply to a microservice architecture, because a badly designed domain model usually implicates that you have something, some of, of the uh, microservice writing pattern, which means that uh, you can have uh, cascading changes. You know, I'm going to do microservices, then I just split my architecture in two, but my boundaries are so bad that whenever I deploy a change here, I have to deploy this one too, okay? That's why we call it coordinated deployments, which is a very bad only pattern for microservices. And I think all of you have heard of Conway's Law. Uh, we have this communication between people, again, people. And we need to respect that. And I like to say that you should never start an architecture using a microservices, although there are some exceptions uh, in our industry. But usually, your software usually, uh, always starts with a monolith. And when you gain enough knowledge about the domain model, you can split something better, that, because you know that this part of the system changes uh, in a different pace. Uh, uh, of the rest of the system, so you can split that into a microservice. But, uh, and usually, uh, the, the examples that, that we have in our industry, we have, uh, we have some great talks about up to Randy Shoup, which is the former director of technology of Google and eBay. And uh, uh, yeah, I had the opportunity to meet him uh, once. And one of the key things that I've learned is that when they designed that microservice architecture in these companies, they just, they, they just didn't plan for that. They, they started like a monolith. They just keep adding people. And since we have a lot of smart engineers in these groups, they just decided by themselves, uh, guys, it's not working. We have too many people committing on the same thing. So they decided by themselves to split things. Oh, from this moment on, half of this room is going to do this thing, and half of the room is going to do the other thing. Because we can't communicate very well what are we doing. And, it's, and we know this fact, because when you have smaller teams, everybody knows what the other is doing, and you have some doubt, you can just tap on the shoulder and ask, oh, I don't know how this works. Am I, am I going to break what you're doing? So the communications are much simpler. And uh, since it happens with people, we know that every time that we, can, then, that we cannot talk with everybody at the same moment, you just, communicate, you just create a, a, a virtual structure which is a barrier between the two people uh, delivering code. So uh, naturally, if I, if, I, if I get a very large code base with everybody in this room coding, I'm going to have uh, this half of the room, the other half of the room. Automatically, people start calling us and them. Okay? And when you have uh, uh, us and them communication, naturally, you create a protocol. So I believe that in microservices, too, when we create this kind of protocol, we're just creating the natural communication infrastructure that we have between teams, and we're just making it explicit within, with some boundaries using an API. I want to call about the two pizza rule. I, I used to do this joke in other countries about the two pizza rule, because we never know how much people will, can be fed with two pizza. And I know that the pizzas in America are much bigger than the rest of the world. And I also don't know the, the size of the Americans. Yeah? Maybe we have people that can eat a, a pizza by themselves. Yeah. So when we're talking about microservices, uh, we're talking a lot, a lot about um, containers and everything else, uh, self-contained software. 
but I like to I prefer the notion of self-contained teams. Yeah? Instead of you have a dev and ops, uh, most of the successful microservice architectures that are implemented in, in our industry are delivered by people that are self-contained teams. We have devs and ops and architects and DBAs and the network guys and everybody, everyone else uh, in the same group delivering just one product and not, uh, not uh, just another, another project. So we have self-contained teams. And I, I like this notion very much because that's, that's one of the principles that I've been trying to follow all my life. Because I think that uh, when you take people away from the consequence of their acts, usually bad things happen. And if you're able just to commit something and not be held responsible for what happens with that as a production, you just deliver bad software. So if you can be held responsible for what you're doing, you have a much better uh, job. Uh, you do better things uh, because you're going to be held responsible for that. And having said all of that about microservices, the number one question after that is, OK, it's a, uh, I know the consequence. I know it's all about people and not, uh, and not just uh, software artifacts. I know I need to, to know the economics of that. I, know to, I, I have to respect Conway's law. And that's the big question is, I have all of that in mind, and how do I run my microservices? Because you can't think about uh, deploying multiple artifacts into production if you don't have an, a very mature DevOps culture, uh, some automated pipelines. And today, 2016, the natural answer for that is a pass. And when I say it pass, I'm talking about this second or third generation pass that we have today, and not the first generation ones, which usually make people have bad feelings about that, but if we're, uh, first generation pairs were tied to lock-in or to a very, uh, very large set of restrictions that require you to, do, to change your architecture to fit that. Uh, when I'm talking about pass, I'm talking about the container-based pass that we have today. And we have some many good options in the market today to deliver uh, this pass for us to deploy our uh, microservice architectures. And we say, when we talk about pass, we always have this question too. Should I buy a pass or should I build one? Uh, the pioneers in our, in our industry, they didn't have this choice. They decided to build that. So that's why we have some companies like Netflix, like Amazon, or like Google, they didn't have the choice to, to buy one. They just had to build by themselves. And now we use them as role models for our industry. But luckily for us, now we have some pretty good uh, container orchestration technologies and other tools, too, that are aggregated on top of that to help us on delivering this microservice architecture into production. One of them is Kubernetes. Along, we have some other options like Docker Swarm and Apache Mesos and Kubernetes by Google. Uh, we at Red Hat, we believe that Kubernetes is by far the most mature container orchestration platform because Kubernetes is based on the same technology that Google uses to deploy like two billion containers per week. So uh, we believe also that if, if the, Google might know a thing or two about delivering containers into production. So I think it's a safe bet to, to use the same technology for, for our, well, not billions, perhaps hundreds of, of containers per week. Okay, and Kubernetes is a very, uh, most of the stable deployments that we have in production are using Kubernetes today. And Kubernetes is just a container orchestration layer. If you ever touch at Kubernetes, you know that's a very low level tool. Uh, you, the, that's a very ops tool. But for developers, we, need, we, we probably need an, an additional layer to help us with this with the things that we want to do today, because it's software de the deployment pipelines, we want to do A-B testing, canary deployments, blue-green deployments, and all of the other great things that we want to do. So for that, we have uh, OpenShift, which is a pass that runs on top of Kubernetes. There are other solutions in the market that runs on top of Kubernetes too. But we, uh, of course, we believe that OpenShift is the most uh, appropriate solution for enterprise companies. and. Now that I've talked all of that, I would like to say, how do I begin my journey? I, want to, I don't have a microservice architecture, but I want to begin uh, this journey towards microservices. And yeah, the, first, the very first pattern that we have in our industry for developing microservices is the Strangler application. I don't know how many of you can recognize that, but that tree is a Strangler fig, 
which is also a, a, the common fig. I, I don't know if there are known strangler figs, but this is what strangler fig, which is usually the bird they shit the seeds on top of the trees, and the, 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 the tree just starts to grow. And when the roots, they reach the ground, yeah, it starts to get stronger, and the roots are just getting stronger and stronger and stronger, yeah, which is supposed to be our microservices. And then uh, sometimes the roots get so strong and so big that it strangles the whole tree. So typically, your microservice architecture will be built around a monolith. And you will be growing your microservices around your monolith until up to the point that's not worth maintaining your monolith anymore. Or perhaps your monolith is not changing anymore. It's better just to leave him uh, untouched and just create a, a new functionalities using your new microservices. And I talked about domain-driven design, but uh, the number one feature of domain-driven design that we have to apply into microservices are the bounded contexts. How do I identify my aggregates and my entities so that I can properly model the things that they don't, don't fall apart later, so I don't have these any patterns like cascading uh, deployments. And now I'll pass through some very common microservices architectures that we can see in the markets. One is the the client aggregating multiple microservices. You might have a client. It can be a mobile application, a desktop application, uh, uh, an embedded system. Uh, so you have multiple microservices, multiple features being run by different artifacts into production. Each one of these artifacts can be implemented in a different technology. You can use Wildfly Swarm. You can use Spring Boot. You can use Node.js. One of the things that people advocate for microservices is that you can use the best technology for the two. Uh, but we, we in our industry, we, we have seen that some companies prefer to do that. Amazon lets you choose anything that you want. But Netflix prefers to standardize on a common ground because they don't want the, their engineers spending their time so everybody solving the same problems over and over again. They just, somebody solves the problem, oh, we can reuse something of that, then they just share uh, something between all our teams. So it requires you to, to have the same base ground technology on that, and Netflix standardized on, on top of the JVM. So there's not a right or wrong pattern around which tech, if we should share a common technology between all of the microservices or not, but it's up to you to decide which one is, is most appropriate for you. Yeah? We believe that most of the enterprise companies are running Java, Java and pro most probably a Java E application. Maybe you want to reuse your current knowledge of Java E. Maybe you, you, don't want, you, you want to keep using Java E, but you want to run another environment like Spring Boot or Drop Wizard or, uh, uh, or something else, or you want to, to go to Node.js. It really depends. Yeah, I like a sentence from Kent Beck. Uh, he once, I believe it was Kent Beck, he once said that any smart answer to any non-trivial question always starts with it depends. So. It depends. Another common Microsoft pattern for deployment is the API gateway. Now you have this, this, this application. You have each piece of code of my application is accessing a different endpoint, a different microservice. Maybe at some point you want to integrate all of that into an API gateway, which is another very common architecture. You know, you remember when we had the design pattern facade, the reasons for doing that. API gateway is the same. Maybe we want a centralized point of authentication, of logging, of routing. Maybe we want to add some features into API Gateway. In fact, we have many interesting deployment scenarios and tools that we can play with. And for that, usually, we need some kind of centralized point of deployment and routing for achieving that. So I'll explain that later. But since we're talking, I'll just talk about, a bit about resilience. resilience. Uh, we have to talk about reliability, and I like this, this sentence from Jeff Dean of Google. Reliability must come from software. We cannot trust hardware. We cannot trust infrastructure. For you can have the best infrastructure in the world, it fails. So we as software developers, we must design for failure. We must be prepared because uh, in a microservice architecture, Many, we have many more moving parts, and we have many more things that can go wrong, okay? You cannot allow that a single piece of your architecture can simply get uh, all of your system down, so you need to prepare for that. And we have a lot of different patterns 
to be used on that. So design for failure must be embraced. First number one rule of Microsoft architecture, you must design for failure. It must be embedded into your codes. And for that, we have some common patterns, which is the circuit breaker pattern and the book head pattern. Circuit breaker is something just goes wrong. You cannot allow it to propagate. So it just opens a secret, so it, the, 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 the problem gets confined into that microservice. And the book heads is the same thing. You just don't let your whole ship, uh, your whole, uh, ship sink because one of the compartments is flooding. So, and the most popular implementation of the circuit breaker pattern in our industry is provided by the Netflix OSS tech, which is Hystrix. I don't know how many of you have touched with Hystrix before? Yeah. The sum. And Hystrix, you know, if you get the Hystrix uh, code base, it's an absurdly simple thing to be implemented. So, but uh, it's not worth in solving the same problem again. That's why many, if not all, of the implementation that, that we have today are based on Hystrix. Okay? And the, the only thing about Hystrix uh, is that if you use plain Hystrix in your code, it starts to feel a bit uh, bulky because you have a, it, it's like a distributed try catch. So you have to run the thing that runs okay, and then when things go wrong, how do you, how do you deal with that? So in terms of code, maybe you need something more compared with Hystrix, but, but most of the stacks that we have today just, just integrates with the Netflix Hystrix. And uh, since everybody these days is, talk, is talking about Hystrix, I would, look, I would like to call your attention to smart routing. Because smart routing is something that you deploy into your API gateway to have some very interesting deployment patterns, such as blue-green deployments, A-B testing, canary deployments, and specifically debugging and tracing. Uh, you see, uh, I believe that most of the companies, they don't have the maturity to be using smart routing. So if you get Kubernetes and OpenShift, the rolling upgrade features of Kubernetes and OpenShift with Keep Alive and everything else, health checks, will be enough for you to deploy your microservice architecture. But if you reach uh, some level of maturity, maybe you want to consider some more advanced scenarios. And for that, uh, you're, gonna have, you're gonna need a smart router. The, uh, I believe that the most popular implementation of smart router today in the market is also from Netflix, which is Zoo. And if you get, take a look at the Zoos, Z-U-U-L, from the Ghostbusters movie, okay? If you know, if you, get, you look at the code base, it's so ridiculously simple, simple, because uh, you, they just get a polar um, that checks for groovy scripts and just uh, from a certain folder in your server, and it reloads the few definitions whenever they, they, they found on the version. So it's very, very simple, but it works like that because the Netflix infrastructure runs on top of Cassandra. So they already have a distributed file system to run that. So maybe if you're running Kubernetes and OpenShift, you want to try another solution. Maybe you want to, to run a cluster of fast storage. Maybe you want to implement your filters uh, using databases or uh, another kind of data store, uh, it's up to you. It just reloads Groovy scripts on the fly uh, so that we can have blue-green deployments to different environments deployed into production so we can just route the request from one to another so we can programmatically choose the amount of requests that we, we go from one server to the other, which is like the scenario for A-B testing because playing most of the infrastructure providers, which is the case for now for Kubernetes, they just do dumb routing for A-B testing. You have to check how uh, I want 10% of my request to, do to, that, to go to that deployment, or 20% to go to that deployment. And sometimes you, want, you, you are only having issues with the iOS users. The Android users are doing fine. You just want to test the iOS users. So I just want to route the iOS users to that deployment to test that feature. Or maybe just the customers with some parameters configuring their account are having that issues. You want that specific set to go to a deployment. You need programmatically routing and not just dumb routing, which is the most infrastructure providers do. Canary deployments too. Uh, you can do programmatic uh, deployment instead of just letting the infrastructure just pump up your canary deployment, uh, 10, 20 or something. Maybe you want to divide your, your customers into groups. You have a beta group 
they're the nicer guys. Yeah? You know, if something ha bad happens, they, they, they can call you anytime. They will help you to solve your problems. Maybe that's your canary, in the net, not just 10% of the users. So uh, for that, you need smart routing. Uh, and for now, uh, I'm not going to show today, but we're working on a proof of concept using Zoo into Kubernetes and OpenShift. So uh, expect uh, much more from us in this, in this situation in the next few months. And the specific debugging and tracing, sometimes you have an issue which is only happening which with a specific user or a specific subset of the users. And you don't want to flood your logging with the, all of the transactions that are happening. You just want to see what that user is doing so you can debug what is happening exactly into production. You need smart routing to specific debugging and, uh, of course, tracing. You want to know, because if you have a microservice, you have a lot of different requests coming from a lot of different endpoints. And how can you trace the, re the requests that come from endpoint A, B, C, and D and ended end up on E? Yeah. How do you know which request came from all of these microservices? So you need tracing, and we need some, some kind of solution for that. But uh, now I'm going to show you uh, a demo. Uh, okay. Oh, it's just blink sometimes. And then I'm going to maximize for that. Yeah. For all of this demo that I'm going to show you, it runs on top of the Red Hat Container Development Kit. Uh, I don't know how many of you tried to install uh, Kubernetes on your own host, because you know, it's not the same thing when you just have Docker on your notebook and you deploy on an orchestration solution like Kubernetes and OpenShift. You need the same environment for, to test your microservices, because you need to deploy all of your microservices on your notebook to test the correct behavior that will go into production. So you need an orchestrator in your, in, in your notebook. And sometimes deploying Kubernetes in a machine can be a pain in the ass. That's why we just provided for developers the Red Hat Container Development Kits, which is a ready-to-go Vagrant box. You just download that box and get it running with a Vagrant app. You have your whole Kubernetes and OpenShift setup in your, in your VM. So it's very easy to get it started uh, with uh, Red Hat CDK. Then, and the source code of the demo that I'm going to show you is on GitHub, which is the Red Hat Hello World MSA. We like to say that this is a playground for us to be developing some proof of concepts around microservices. So a lot of the things that we're doing around microservices we're developing on this uh, GitHub organization. So all of the, the services that I'm going to show you are deployed on that. And uh, deploy the, all of them on OpenShift. And if you open our application, it has this very nice console. So we have here some patterns that we, uh, some of them I show you, which is the browser as a client. The browser is acting as a client. Whoops. As a, Just hold still. Okay. Bad connection. That's why you need a circuit breaker. Okay. 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 Using browser as a client, you know, uh, we just created some hello world microservices. So they just say hello in a different language, and they say the name of the pod that they're running inside Kubernetes. So you know uh, everything is working here. Oops. The Aloha. Uh, service is not working quite properly. So you have a, an error message. No, now it's working. Yeah. So I think it was an old thing that I was testing. So you have this API, the, this browser as a client. So each one of these this boxes in the interface is requesting a, a, a different information from each one of the microservices, which is usually the architecture number one that people deploy into production. The, the, usually the architecture number two, okay, is the API gateway where you just centralize the, you don't want uh, your clients doing multiple requests. Why? Maybe you're on a mobile application. Maybe you want to, to, to reply different kinds of outputs depending on your clients. And also if you have a mobile application, you don't want your, 
Uh, you don't want your, bra your mobile application issuing multiple requests to multiple different points because it consumes uh, some precious bytes. So maybe you want to aggregate all of them and just do a very small re response to your, to your application. So this API Gateway, it just concentrates all of the requests here and returns that to you. Then another pattern that you might have and probably will mix with the API gateways is service chaining. You just don't have a lot of microservices, plain microservices, and each one of, the, the, uh, one of them being aggregated by an API gateway. Usually you need to, to generate a response. You need multiple information from different microservices, you, so you need to chain the request from one to other. Okay, so that's what we have here. Okay, and I'm going to show you some source code. Oh, well, or perhaps uh, I'll show you first some, what happens if something goes badly. First, I'm going to scale up this Aloha. So you see, in OpenShift, it's very easy to scale up your, your pods. So I only had one running, now I uh, will have two. Once my, uh, yeah. And I say sorry for that because my machine only has 16 gigabytes and we're running a lot of different microservices here. So it takes, it consumes a bit of memory. Now I have two pods running. And if I access my dashboard and refresh that. Okay, the Aloha. You can see that the pod of where the request come from Aloha, it changes because OpenShift has a built-in load balancer, so each one of the requests reaches a different pod each time I, I hit reload. Then no API gateway. It happens the same. Uh, it's just changing the, the request they're hitting. And now I'm gonna, oops. I want to show you the code. Enter presentation mode. So basically, I'm going to show you the code, the, the, the stack that we chose to implement this API gateway with the Hastrix fallback to see what happens when something goes wrong. Is the Netflix stack. So we're using basically here, we're using, I don't know how many, how many of you are, are aware of the Netflix stack? Okay. Well, more or less. Then. Uh, uh, of the libraries of the Netflix stack, we chose uh, Fane, which is basically a, a proxy library that allows us to create just some Java code to, to access some REST endpoints. Uh, uh, we also chose Fane because it has built-in history support. We don't have to code anything, it just has tricks embedded. So we, we, can have, we can do some beautiful lambdas. We're not using uh, Ribbon, because Ribbon is for client-side load balancing. And since we're using Kubernetes, Kubernetes handles that for, for us. We don't need client-side load balancing. We have server-side load balancing. We also don't need service discovery because uh, Kubernetes has a built-in service discovery mechanism. We don't need to implement something like Consu or Zookeeper or something else. No? We just have this out of the box with Kubernetes. And if you get the code, uh, maybe you can think that this code is a bit complex because uh, there is a lot of lines and you have to understand what everything is happening. But I can assure you that this code is very simple. The only thing that is complicated in this code is the Zipkin library, uh, which is the thing I'm, I'm going to talk about later. But uh, basically, Zipkin is a, is a distributed tracing library, which is based on a project called, uh, on a paper that Google uh, published, which uh, talking about this Dapper technology. So Google implemented a, a technology for distributed tracing. He wants to trace the request that is coming through its microservice architecture. So Twitter took that paper and implemented it to code. And, the, the, uh, and this implementation is called uh, Zipkin. And the client library for Zipkin is an open source project called Brave. And we have Brave implementations mainly for Java, but other technologies too. Okay. So the, the complex thing here is basically Zipkin because we do not have a built-in implementation for Zipkin on Fane. But maybe it's open source, somebody wants to do that. Okay. And Red Hat also is working on another distributed tracing technology. 
Uh, uh, well, I can't make any guarantees of that, but maybe uh, someone is implementing on, uh, something on top of Hocular to do distributed tracing also inside our uh, uh, OpenShift architecture, okay? So, but if you get the code, basically it means that thing, yeah, I want to, to implement something, and if I want to invoke here, uh, basically the, the implementation means I want to, to uh, uh, Fain, I want you to connect to this endpoint, to the Aloha endpoint, to the Bonjour endpoint, to the Hello endpoint, and if anything goes wrong, if the request just gives me an error, or if the network times out, or if I get an invalid response, I want you to fall back to another implementation. And in, in our case, our fallback is just a Java Lambda, uh, which, read, uh, which returns a plain string for you. But we know that in a real world situation, you, in most of the cases, you can't just return a, a default answer. You might want to implement a, a, a separate data store to cache your results. Maybe you want to have another source of information. Uh, so maybe you want to, maybe you, you, you declare it to be the cache and you're just caching the previous responses and you allow, and you allow that in the next one hour, uh, you consider that them valid. Or maybe you want to implement a true distributed uh, data store that is updated using events, using a Kafka uh, bus or a Veritas bus, or you even using ActiveMQ. So uh, uh, there are many different deployments and strategies that can, you can use to allow for fallback. We're just using a plain old Java string to allow you for fallback. That, so that's mainly the, the thing code. You call. Uh, uh, a response from something that you already have instead of relying on network communication. And the default timeout for history is one second. So it checks if it doesn't return anything between HTTP 200 and 399. Uh, it just uh, considers that an error. And also if it takes longer than one second, it just falls back to the default answer. Okay, so. Back again, so what happens if I take the Aloha service down? So it's not replying anymore. If I just refresh the results, you can see, yeah, now it's, uh, we, uh, Aloha has the fallback default implementation, it's just a plain string, and I have that with the service chain two. If I hit refresh here, you can see that it's not chain anymore because the last one was supposed to be bonjour. But since Aloha is falling back, it's just answering the default answer. And if I keep hitting hard enough, uh, we know that since Aloha failed, now I have my circuit open, but I want, as, a, as an ops guy monitoring my microservice architecture, I want to check the state of each one of the micro, microservices to see if it's working or not. So we have Histrix also has this Histrix dashboard where it's, yeah, it's hard, <laughs> where it aggregates, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, networks can fail, projectors can fail too, that, that's why you must design for failure. Re rehearse that, okay? And so it has a very beautiful panel that shows you how many requests are, are, are incoming per second, everything else. You can set up a threshold where you want, oh, if 10% uh, uh, of my requests are timing out or giving invalid response, I want you to open the circuit. So automatically, Histrix will open the circuit and just provide a fallback. So you can have this beautiful panel, uh, which is real time, uh, to tell you what is happening, what is the state of your microservices running to our architecture. And uh, for our luck, for, uh, since we're lucky, Histrix is already tightly integrated into OpenShift, thanks to the Fabricate guys. So it's very easy to, to just get up and running the Histrix da dashboards into your, into your deployments if you deploy the Histrix library in your code. So if you have just, just your standard code base, you deploy a Histrix library, you configure that, and you have the Histrix dashboard on top of OpenShift. And the other thing that I want to show is the Zipkin uh, dashboard, which is the distributed tracing technology that we're showing up now. And I'll just... Okay, reduce here. So if I want to pick up a microservice, I'll pick up the API gateway, which is usually the most interesting one to show. 
And we can trace some transactions here. I want to trace uh, only the transactions that took more than some certain amount of milliseconds. Here, I want to, uh, to have a boundary of time to show the request, but I just hit the default query stuff. So it's showing me some requests, and I can pick each one of these requests that come from the API gateway. It can show me how many time uh, it took for each one of the microservices to reply. Uh, because it, it uses a dis distributed ID between each one of the requests to know oh, this request took this time. So, bonjour, five milliseconds. Uh, hola, three milliseconds. Uh, hola, four. Hello. I did not, not show anything. Namaste. One second. And I don't know why. I don't want to, to have some prejudices here. But in all of my tests, the bonjour service, which is a Node.js application, uh, is always the one that takes more time. Okay, since we're Java guys, we can't complain about that. Okay, okay well, not here, the three seconds. But sometimes uh, the bonjour service takes like uh, 30 milliseconds to reply, uh, and the other ones usually take one, two, or three, or four milliseconds. So uh, um, uh, we don't have that ready yet, but uh, distributed tracing is useful for you for timing your requests, because each one of the requests, if I open that, that up, can show you, oops, or not. Yeah, I know. OK. But maybe it can be my notebook, too, because sometimes it happens with other projections, too. So we can see each one of the requests that were made, the, the relative time, the absolute time, the, the host, what happened, and everything else. And this is for the Zipkin dashboard. But since each one of these requests now have a distributed transactions, uh, if you have a login aggregation system, uh, you can use some uh, less search with Logstash and Kibana. If you deploy that, you can just have your transactions and just aggregate that specific transactions to check uh, how a specific transaction is, is going on in your system. So it's a, and that's an absolute requirement. If, if you have an error happening somewhere, you want to take that transaction ID and debug a distributed, or your distributed system. Okay. So that's one of the things, one of the few things that I wanted to show you. We have much more in coming because that's, uh, but I would like to remember all of you that remember it's a journey. We're just giving the very first step, migrating our monolithic applications to microservices. And also I would like to remind you that monoliths aren't necessarily bad and microservices isn't necessarily good because it's all about trade-offs. Architecture is always about trade-offs, but I think that the main problem about my, my, that we're trying to solve around microservices are scaling people. We want to split people using the same code base, using a smaller bounded context. And we are taking the very first steps. We have much more content. We have much more sessions. Uh, we have to deal with microservices with event consistency. We want to use smart routing. We didn't show you today, but I. Hopefully, we'll be able to show in a few weeks in, uh, in other talks. We want to do, and now that since each microservices uses a different database, to do reporting, you, you just used to issue an SQL to your server and have a response. Now, you can't do that anymore because they're not, can't, can't be even SQL. It can be a flat file system. Uh, it can be a MongoDB, and you want to aggregate all of that results. It's another problem that you have to solve. Luckily, you have technology for that, to aggregate this result be between distributed data source to generate a report or even a query for you to show. Uh, maybe uh, just synchronous communication is not enough. Maybe we need to be reactive. Maybe we need to be asynchronous. Maybe we need to, to use CQRIS in our applications and event sourcing to guarantee uh, the scalability of our system. Uh, maybe we need some techniques to guarantee this, this consistency. Since we're now uh, using asynchronous communications, uh, we, we need some boundaries between consistency that we need to declare. And all of these are related to distributed systems and the microservice architecture. And if you're interested in everything that we're producing around this microservice architecture, I strongly suggest you to join developers.redhat.com uh, where we will be pu publishing books, articles, webinars, videos. 
and uh, delivering software just like the Red Hat CK, the Red Hat Enterprise Linux you want to try, the developer studio, the dev su development suits, which are the things that we announced this week at, here at Dev Nation. And if you want to take all of that, inclusive, we're distributing microservices for Java developers book from O'Reilly, and we're writing two more books this year for you, which is all free if you register at developers.redhat.com. And that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you very much. Thank you.